me add my welcome for all of you who are here. Thank you for joining us as we begin a new series, and we're going to look at some stranger things in the Bible. And if you're familiar with the Bible at all, you know already there's some strange stuff in there. What are we to make of that? Before we jump into our message for today, I want to bring you up to speed about something um, very important. And if you've been around for a while, you know that we've been trying to get a group of people into the Weber County Jail for some time to bring hope and encouragement um, to a place where that is not always the case. And for a long time, that door was closed to us and we had a really hard time, but just recently, um, that opportunity um, presented itself, and now we have a group that's been checked out and all of that. Um, interesting thing, you know, when they do a background check on you, it also shows um, people who have concealed carry permits. They said, we've never seen a group with such a large concealed carry <laughs> as this church. So I... Let's keep it holstered today, okay? That's just... Um... <laughs> going to be safe here. Um, but we have a group that's ready to go. And that group is going to present, you know, just our service. This is going to be the first service that the people in the Weber County Jail get to see. So would you, they're going to be able to hear you, would you help me welcome some new friends at the Weber County Jail who are joining us through this service? And everyone there, we are honored to have you with us. So let's turn our attention um, to our message for today, Stranger Things in the Bible. And we're going to take a look at a story that is about lost and found. It is about something that someone did not mean to lose, but they lost it anyway. And then it is recovered in the most miraculous and unusual ways. And I think we know what it's like to lose something that we did not mean to lose. I mean, just, you know, by show of hands here, at the very lowest level, has anyone besides me ever been walking around looking for their sunglasses or their regular glasses, and you can't find them, and then five or 10 or 15 minutes later, you discover they were on the top of your head, you know, all along, anyone done that? I am so glad I'm not the only one. How about this one? You're looking around for your keys and you can't find them anywhere, and sure enough, they're in your pocket the entire time. We sometimes lose what we did not mean to lose. Made me think about some incredible lost and found stories, and uh, I was just looking at some of those online. This one just really made me uh, kind of say, wow, that is unusual. Lena Paulson was in the middle of an epic baking session just before Christmas of 1995 when she removed her ring and placed it on the kitchen counter. At some point during the day, the ring disappeared, and Lena and her husband, Olaf, looked everywhere for the lost jewelry item. When they remodeled their kitchen a few years later, they even took the opportunity to search behind all the appliances under the floorboards to no avail. Ring is gone. Finally, the couple gave up hope on ever finding the ring. 16 years after the ring disappeared, Lena was outside pulling up the last of her carrots in the garden when she noticed something strange about one of the carrots. The tiny vegetable had a strange thing wrapped around it. When she looked closer, Lena realized the carrot had grown inside her wedding band. And after a quick cleaning, the white gold band that adored, was adorned with diamonds looked as good as new. While no one knows for sure how the ring ended up in the garden, Olaf has a few theories. We thought maybe it had fallen into the compost food bin. Perhaps it ended up in the compost that was spread over the vegetable patch later. But what do you know? That carrot grew down through it. All, alternatively, he speculated that maybe the family sheep, known for sneaking in and munching on some of the family kitchen scraps, had done so and then through the natural process of things had redeposited that back out in the garden area. But... That's an incredible story. And we're going to look at one of those today that's in the Bible. And you know what? It's strange. It's unusual. 
And I think right up front, we just got to acknowledge there's some stuff in the Bible that is strange. And we might wonder, what in the world does that have to do with me and where we are? But I think we all know what it's like to lose something that we didn't mean to lose. And we may wonder, well, how am I supposed to recover it? Maybe there was a time in your life, you know, where you were excited about um, just pursuing God. But maybe you find yourself today and you say, you know, that, that passion isn't there. And maybe as you look back, you say, I don't know exactly where, you know, that got lost, but it's not there now, and it was there once upon a time. Maybe there was this joy inside of you that you can remember. And it was a joy that was there regardless of the circumstances around you, but today you say, yeah, that's not there anymore. I don't know where that joy went but it's not here anymore. Maybe there was a strong faith inside of you that allowed you to endure. Endure even when times were hard, but not anymore. And you find it hard to make it through some of the hardest days. Maybe there was a time in your marriage or in some friendship where there was a closeness and there was a spark and you look today and you say, yeah, I don't know where that went but I don't see it there anymore. See, I think we know what it's like to lose something that we didn't mean to lose. And chances are we wonder, how can I get that back? And today we're going to take a look at a story that is all about that. And while it is a little bit unusual, I think it helps us to have a sense of how we can get that back. What mattered to us so much, what's missing so much, can be recovered, can be regained. So just before we jump into this passage here, let me give you just a little bit of a context. One of the key players in the story is a prophet by the name of Elisha. And maybe you've heard that name before, and maybe you haven't. Elisha is one of the uh, just premier figures in the Old Testament. He performs the most recorded miracles in the Bible until somebody named Jesus comes along a number of years later. And he's done some pretty incredible things up until this point. He has an impressive track record, and he is the leader of, you know, just this whole arena of being a prophet. What is a prophet? God called and gifted and enabled people and worked through them to speak on behalf of God and also to perform some amazing works through them. It wasn't about that person. It was ultimately about God. And Elisha is one of the guys that people looked to and said, he's the man. He's got passion. He's got the track record. God has worked through this guy. So as you can imagine, that drew some people around him. And in this story, we're going to see that there's some young prophets who have become, for lack of a better term, part of a prophet school where they're coming to learn from the master. And the events that unfold around the story happen in the context of this group of people coming to study under a prophet named Elisha. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. So they're hanging out. It's too crowded. You know what? We've got the opportunity to expand this whole thing. So let's head down there, cut some trees down, and build something that works. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us. Someone suggested, I will, he, Elisha, said. So he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall, the man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it in the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. That's strange, isn't it? <laughs> That's just a strange story. And what are we to make about that? It is a story of something that was lost someone didn't mean to lose, and it being recovered. And I think what, you know, we might wonder about this story is, you know, okay, maybe that happened, and maybe if you're skeptical, you're saying, you know, we don't see that happen, and so I'm not so sure about that. 
But no matter where we might stand in that whole spectrum there, we may, you know, ask this question, what does any of that have to do with people like us? But if you know what it's like to lose something, it has a lot to do with you. And one of the keys to what is said there is when that young prophet says, it was a borrowed axe. And we might think, well, what's the big deal about that? You know, in the scheme of things, of what goes on in this world, an axe head just isn't at the top of, you know, the list of things that I would come up with as, you know, saying that's really important. Why not just get in your chariot, head down to the local ace, you know, and get yourself another access, like not that big a deal. One of the things you got to realize back then, you know, metal was hard to come by. And if you wanted an axe head, here's what you had to do. You had to mine the ore out of the ground. You had to get it to a blacksmith who would shape it into that, you know, shape of that axe head. And then you would have to put some oil on it to keep it from rusting. And so there was some cost and there was some work that came along with it. And prophets, especially young ones like this, pretty much existed on little to nothing. And so it puts this guy in a position where he borrowed something that he has now lost. Didn't mean to, but he lost it anyway. He owes a debt that he cannot repay. And if you wonder if that has anything to do with us, oh, it does. And Pastor Jimmy helped us, you know, to picture that just a little bit before during communion. Spiritually speaking, any one of us, when it comes to a relationship with the Holy God, you know where we are? We're in a place of owing a debt that none of us can repay. And so where does that leave us? The amazing news about the goodness of God is that he came and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he addressed that situation, and that is a theme that's not just kind of picked out of the story, but here's a place in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He's talking primarily about how to live in a very loose culture of that time. And he says, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who lives in you and was given to you by God. Did you do it? Did you accomplish it? No, it was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. Why not? For God bought you with a high price. So he says, in light of that, honor God. God paid the highest price that anyone has ever seen. Because he paid with his own blood. He paid with his own life. And he stood in the place that you and I should have because we owed a debt that we could not repay. And so just in a picture, you know what happens on that day by that river? The guy's probably chopping away there. And maybe on the back swing, you know, he takes a big back swing. And then before you know it, the axe head falls in the water. And I want to conduct just a little bit of a test here. Will an axe head normally float? I feel a little bit like David Letterman back in the day of will it float? I don't know if you've ever seen that. And nope, it won't float. And that's our story. Something was lost. And now somebody is in a position where they owe something that they cannot repay. It was borrowed. It's not mine. Now what do I do? And I think for any of us that maybe have been kind of chopping away in our own lives, and maybe at one point in time we saw movement, we saw traction, we saw things moving forward, but one day you feel as busy as ever, and maybe you're burned out, or maybe you're just passionless, or maybe you're just tired, but you know it's not from an inactivity But when you look around, you realize, you know, somewhere along the way, I lost my edge. And I'm still doing things, but nothing's happening. Nothing's being accomplished. And you know what that has to do with us, too? Just like an axe is made for a specific purpose. This, all by itself, can't get the job done. It was formed and it was fashioned, it was forged for a specific purpose. There is not one person here today who lives in this world who is not here for a purpose, for a reason. 
And you were formed and you were fashioned and you were made by God for a purpose. And that purpose begins when we step into a relationship with God. It's his doing. It's our receiving. And inside of that relationship, you were made and equipped to do things that would advance God's good purposes and accomplish a reason for which you are here. But maybe you find yourself at that place where you're like, man, I'm busy, but I'm not sure any of that is happening. How do we get our edge back? Well, the rest of this story helps us to understand that. Now I want to walk through this just little by little here because I think it clues us in to exactly how that could happen for you and me, how we can get our edge back. Here's the first thing, get honest with God. And in this story, when it happens, what does this young prophet say? He cries out, oh, sir, he cried. It was a borrowed axe. And the language there, and you see the explanation points that are there, and it tells us that he cried out. This was not one of these just, oh, my goodness, something happened here, and I hope that I can recover this axe head. This is somebody who's expressing desperation. They're expressing just shock and awe and just a sense of, what do I do now? And rather than try to jump into the water or fish it out, what is the first thing that he does? He just cries out in an honest way about the desperate situation in which he finds himself. I fear that many times in a relationship with God or even entertaining the idea of a God, we might think, well, God is just all about the good times and God wants me to come with a happy face and a smile, you know, that that just adorns, you know, these lips of mine. This story tells us, oh, no, that's not the truth. That we can be honest with God about whatever it is that we face. And sometimes we're even taught that, you know what? Keep, you know, the other stuff that's a little bit more negative to yourself. Come to God with all that is good and right and holy. But here's the reality about God. He knows the truth about us anyway. So the only one we're fooling in that moment is ourselves. We're not fooling God with anything. And so here is somebody who cries out with an honest cry. Have you ever heard the expression, an ugly cry? Right? If you're a lady, you know, there might be mascara running, you know, and if you're a dude, you don't want anybody else to see you because you've been taught your whole life to keep yourself together and all of that. This is an ugly cry on that day where that guy just says, oh no, what am I going to do now? Wasn't mine to begin with. And the starting place for us, if we've lost something that we didn't mean to lose and we wonder how to recover it, is just be honest is just to get real with whatever it is that we face. Now, here's the pushback, you know, when I was thinking about this, I thought, yeah, okay, get honest with God, but we're talking about an ax head. You know, it would be different, wouldn't it, if we were talking about something that was of incredible importance, right? I told you about Elisha and his track record. Do you know some of the things that he has done before this day? He's raised a guy from the dead. He healed a guy from leprosy by dipping him in some water a few times. He made a, an entire source of water purified and rescued an entire community. He blinded an enemy army to protect the nation of Israel at a point of dire need. And we go, yeah, in this world of ours, with bigger picture issues like that, it seems like an ax head just isn't that big of a deal. I get the guy, you know, can't repay that. Maybe he can borrow some money off of his friends or something like that. But I got to tell you, as right as that sentiment might be, because you might be sitting there saying, yeah, but what if my marriage feels like? It's lost at the bottom of the water. Or what if my child is in harm's way? Man, what are we talking about in comparison with an ax head? And there may be a conclusion that we come to that God is great because nothing is too big for him. And that's true. God can do great things. You know what this story tells us? God is great because nothing is too small for him. And if there is something that is big enough for you to worry about, it matters to him. And you can get honest with God about that. 
And if God cares about axe heads, do you think he cares about your marriage? You bet he does. If he cares about axe heads, do you think he cares about your, your child? You bet he does. Whatever it is, great or small, get honest with God about what it is that you've lost. Second part of this process that unfolds here, not only do you get honest with God, look where you lost it. Right? In one sense, the axe head isn't lost. It's exactly where it fell. It's right there. But from a human perspective, a lot of times we wonder where that might be. The edge that you may have lost is right back where you lost it. So where do we go? Here's the good news about God, that if, you know, we get some distance between us and God, or we feel like maybe we've checked out of that relationship with God for a period of time, we don't have to go all the way back, you know, to the very beginning and start the whole thing over. Once we put our hope and trust in God, we are in a relationship with Him. But if we've had a time where we've encountered some distance, we may need to go back to the place where we lost that edge. Well, what do you mean? Let me give you an example from my own life. Many years ago, when I was um, newly, you know, in the role of being a pastor, one of the things that we do is we participate in weddings, right? We stand up on a platform like this, and we walk people through the vows and all of that. And that's an honor. It's a privilege to be able to do that. People are celebrating, and it's, a, it's just an exciting day for everybody who's involved. And everybody, pastors included, want the best for the couple that's standing up there. So I'd done a number of weddings, and I can remember still the couple, the first couple that I joined together in marriage who didn't make it, and they wound up getting divorced. And I got to tell you, the time after that was not a good time for me. And in moments where we have spiritual vitality and other times where it just feels like we're, we're spiritually dry, this was a dry season. And it was months, and I was down, 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 doobie-doo, down, down. And just thinking, well, it, it, it just matters. And one day, you know, trying to do some honesty with God, just talking about all of that. I've never heard an audible voice from God, but there was a thought that came to me that I'm convinced came from God. And that thought went something like this, whatever made you think that was about you? Well, that's a good point. Um, yeah. And you know what I think it is? I think it's a little issue called pride. And pride does make it about us, makes it about me. And so that distance that was created and that dryness that was there and that vitality that was lost, never meant to lose it, where do you find it? You go back to where you lost it. And you realize, you know what? God didn't let me down. Doesn't really point a finger at anything else, you know, that you may have, you know, envisioned one way or another. That God is still God. So how do we do any of this? I think part of what this means is that we can, on a daily basis, a regular basis, we can begin um, a time together with God. And that may be a brand new idea or thought for us, you know, inside of our program every week. We publish some verses there that if you want to just take a journey through the Bible in a year, you can do that and just spend a few minutes with God. This doesn't need to be hours. We're talking maybe 15, 20 minutes. Maybe journaling works for you. I like to write. I hate to journal. So if you don't like journaling, don't do it. But there is a way for you to connect with God on a regular basis. And inside of a relationship like that, just like any other relationship that we might have, as we are in constant communication, we learn that we can trust the one with whom we are speaking. And it could well be in those moments that we can discover exactly where we lost it and go back to that place and recover it. So let me ask you this question. If you've lost your edge in one way or another, where did it go? Where did you lose it? Could it be that maybe it fell into the river of resentment? That there was something or someone that happened 
And ever since that time, or maybe ever since that moment, you have been imprisoned inside of a cell of resentment, and it's time to, to free yourself from that. You may need to go back there and recover what you lost in that space. Could it be that maybe your edge fell into the pond of prayerlessness? And there's a point in time where you just stopped praying because you thought, maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe my prayers only go as high as the ceiling. I don't see it make any difference. And you just let it go. Maybe it's time to go back to where you lost it and pick it up again. Maybe your edge fell into the ocean of obligation. And maybe you had a passion for God and the things of God, but maybe there are all these religious rules and regulations that over time just seemed like a heavier and heavier burden and sooner or later that vitality and that freshness you felt just got wrung out of you and left you empty. Well, maybe it's time to go back and discover God rather than the obligation and go back to who He really is and pick it up there. Maybe your edge fell into the stream of sin where there's this recurring habit hang-up or maybe the result of a hurt. And as you continue that, maybe day by day or different seasons, you think, oh my goodness, I could never talk to God about anything like that. You know, that's something I got to keep here. And because that creates a distance between me and God, who would ever want to be a part of this? You remember what God did for you? He paid the highest price that has ever been paid. That's how much he loves you. And he did it knowing everything about you and me. And he did it anyway. And so he invites us to come just as we are. And if we've been keeping him at a distance, maybe it's time to go back to that place where we recognize he accepts us where we are, but he has not plans to take us somewhere good. He wants to take us on a journey where he transforms us and makes us over. And so begin by getting honest with God. Look where you lost it. Where did it fall? Where do you need to retrieve it? And that's really what the question that's asked there. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it in the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Can Elisha make axe heads float? No. God can and did through Elisha. And then what happens next is the final step that we're going to talk about here in getting our edge back. Get honest with God, look where you lost it, and then with God's help, take it back. Take it back. Here's what happens next. Grab it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and grabbed it. God showed up and worked and caused an axe head that was at the bottom of a river to come up to the surface. And then this young prophet is given one simple command, grab it, reach out and take it. I'm convinced getting your edge back is never more than an arm's length away. But what it often requires is for God to do what only he can do. But then we're also invited to respond with what we can do. And when our faith intersects with God's faithfulness, things change. Our edge can be recovered. Maybe relationships are made right. Maybe our hearts are recalibrated. There simply is no substitute for a step of obedience. And many times it requires God to do something that only He can do. But there will also be a time and an opportunity for us to do what we can do. And a relationship with God, a journey with God, often includes one obedient step after another. But where God wants to take us with that is to a place where that passion that fuels so many of the things of our lives is alive and well 
and draws us closer and closer to Him. What are we saying with all of this? God is able to help us find what we did not mean to lose. Have you lost something? Have you lost your edge? Have you lost something you never intended to lose? And you wonder, what am I supposed to do? Get honest with God about it. Look at the place where you lost it. And with God's help, when he shows up, take it back. Follow God with the opportunity that you have to respond to him. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads together with me. As we mentioned just a little bit earlier, you know, the first step of all of this is realizing that there is a God who has opened the doors to a relationship with him. And he's inviting me in. And if you think, well, who am I? You're exactly right. There's not one of us here that deserves any of that. And as we say, I don't deserve it, and I can't earn it. But still, you gave your life away. And that's how far God's love would go so that we could belong to him. And it begins by being honest about who we are, just acknowledging to God that we've fallen short. And that's the truth about all of us. We're in the same boat. We missed it. And then it is a step of receiving God's grace. Grace is undeserved favor. It's God's gift. And what we do with that gift is an opportunity for us to respond to him. We can invite him into our life, commit ourselves to him, ask him to forgive us. And in that moment, we begin a relationship with God that continues every day through this life and on into the life that is beyond this one. And it's all his doing. And it's offered to people like us. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and all that you have done to throw open the doors to a relationship with the Holy God. Thank you for the time that we had to be even around your communion table, which just reminds us, what does it take to make people like us right with you? It takes the body of Jesus broken for us. It takes the blood of Jesus shed so that our sins could be forgiven. It's pretty extreme, but that's what you did. And so we thank you for that, and we ask that you would help us to know how we can best respond to that in real ways. Thank you for this time together. And God, may you be at work in every heart and life here. And may there be increasingly gratitude inside of these hearts toward the goodness of God. And we ask and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.